I'm Aubrey Sitterson, and this is Scald. You're listening to the only story that matters. Every episode is written by me, and I perform each one of them in one single, flawless take. It's done in the style of the Scandinavian bards from which this show takes its name, Skalds. There's a new episode available every week for more than a year and a half, but you should absolutely feel comfortable jumping right in with this one. After you've listened, after you're hooked, you can always go back to check out previous episodes or pick up the prose volumes available exclusively on Amazon. This isn't me reading you a story. This is me telling you a story. This is Scald, part 83. Maul's fingers drew closer together, tightening around the skinny, sinewy neck of the vermin prince. And his hoe, still tied and bound to the wall. As he lay there upon that filthy floor, helpless, he watched the vermin prince, watched his former student, watched Mouse struggle and gasp for breath, marshalling what little remained of the air in his lungs to let out a simple, plaintive plea. Please, we, we can work together. The brute laughed, a hideous, cruel, mocking guffaw. Work together? He dropped his cudgel, allowing that heavy, blackened, notched and bloody, deceptively heavy branch of the world tree to clatter to the ground. And why should I, why should a king, work with the likes of you? Maul moved his newly free hand to join the other, grasping the vermin prince by his throat, lifting him slowly, steadily, up off the ground. The vermin prince began to kick his spindly, bare legs, the good and the crippled alike, his shame dangling in the open. Please, I, I can, I can help you. Maul shook the scrawny, naked man like a dog shaking its prey. Help me. Help me. I am beyond help. I am beyond aid. I am beyond your saving. Because I do. I shall do. I must do as I have always done. I will save myself. The vermin prince, the light beginning to go out of his eyes, gasped as the brute, the savage, continued to berate him. And what could you, what could a naked, skinny, useless piece of filth do for me? What? Maul looked back over his shoulder, letting his one good eye fall upon Ho who still laid in the filth, bound and silent as the rivers of gore that coated the ground began to flow toward him. Would you bind me? Would you attempt to bind me? Would you attempt to hold captive the one true king of men? The vermin prince stuttered, his body spasming as he fought to form words. No, no, never. I would, I would never. I want to free you, to free everyone, to free Ravana. Recognition flashed in Maul's one good eye. That name, the city, Ravana. 
Though it had been many years, though it had been decades, though the years had held terrors and tortures that he could not bear to think of, that haunted him during his every moment, waking or sleeping, though he had done things, done things to survive, things that made even one such as him, made even the one true king of ashes blanch in horror and disgust, still cutting through the haze, he remembered. And he spoke. Rav. Ravana. Where? He lowered his quarry, placing him roughly upon his feet, dropping him so suddenly that the vermin prince was unable to find his balance, and he crumpled to the filthy, bloody floor in a gasping, heaving heap. Where am I? Vermin Prince struggled for breath, and he took too long to find it. And so he found himself under further assault from Maul, from the destroyer who shot his broad, calloused foot out, kicking the Vermin Prince in the ribs. Where am I? Speak, dog! Wincing. Holding the ribs that felt very much as if they had been cracked, splintered, and shattered, the vermin prince gasped. Ravana! Beneath it! Beneath Ravana! Maul lowered into a crouch and once again seized the vermin prince by the throat. No! Fool! What realm? Where am I? Where have you brought me? The vermin prince clawed, futilely, at Maul's thick, powerful fingers. It, it has no name. A border realm, stranded between the sundered worlds. Maul stared at the vermin prince his rage fighting with his pragmatism. He hated that he was back in that forsaken border realm, hated that he had been summoned there against his will, hated that after so many years, after so many sacrifices, after so much blood and so much agony, that he was still no closer to his goal, to his reward, to his throne, no closer than he had ever been, ever since making that deal, that unholy pact with him. The one that had first stranded him in that strange, savage realm. But still, he wasn't there. He was no longer there. He had been freed, mercifully, from the hell that he had endured, had endured for Decades, he had been brought out of that roiling underneath, the place where madness set in, where it devoured the soul, then abated, so that it might storm the mind's gates once again, that it might once again do more irreparable damage to a man's mental foundation. He had been freed, and though he was no closer to his goal, to his right, to what he truly deserved, at least he wasn't... There. Feeling the savage's grasp loosen as he stared, slack-jawed, motionless. Vermin Prince continued, warily. But I... I could send you elsewhere. I could send you... anywhere. Maul's senses returned to him. Suddenly, quickly, and he growled his response. The realm of men. My realm. Do it. Do it now. The vermin prince forced a smile. One meant to disarm, to calm. I... I cannot. Not yet. That is powerful, difficult magic. Magic that requires certain 
components. Maul clenched his teeth, speaking through those alarmingly white shards of bone. And get them. Get them and send me on my way before I tire of you. The vermin prince shook his head. It is not... It is not that easy. It is why I need your help. There's an item. A weapon. A spear. Of great power. But it is held by a witch. Maul lowered his brows. Who is she? The vermin prince, seeing that he finally narrowly managed to secure the destroyer's attentions, his violent interests, he smiled. She is the ruler of this place, a tyrant. She rules as a queen, but she styles herself as the lady of... Speak plainly! Maul shook the vermin prince once again. What is her name? The vermin prince licked his dry, chapped, cracking lips. He swallowed and he spoke nervously. Calaria. Her name is Calaria. Suddenly, Maul dropped the vermin prince, forcing him down into a pool of stagnant, coagulating blood. And then he stood, a resolute sneer stretching across his face. I will get you your spear. But make no mistake. I do so not out of obedience, not by your command, but by my choice, and my choice alone. I shall take that spear, and I will use it to burn the witch. I will cast her into the unending torment to which she once damned me. And then, then you will send me on my way. You will send me to my realm. You will send me to the realm of men. And once there, once there, I will reign death and destruction down upon the heads of all those who stand in my way, of all those who would keep me from my birthright, from what I deserve, from what is truly mine. My throne. The vermin prince, though naked, though debased, though lying in unspeakable filth and ichor, was delighted. Yes, yes, yes. He began to force himself to his feet, favoring his crippled leg as always. But first, the destroyer stooped low, retrieved his cudgel, that inelegant tool of violence, and then he straightened himself slowly. I am very, very hungry. The vermin prince hobbled forward, limping more than usual, and he massaged his throat, upon which purple, angry bruises were already beginning to form. Yes, yes, of course, you shall have the finest food that my kingdom can offer. Maul turned, his bare feet kicking through the battered and broken bodies at his feet, kicking through the lives that he himself had sent unthinkingly, reflexively, with no remorse, sent them hurtling into that inky black void of nothingness. But as he turned, his eye once again fell upon Ho. Who is that?
as the destroyer gazed upon Ho. Upon the revered master Ho, the creator of the exquisite eight-arm technique, he saw the man's eyes flash, saw them flash in a way that was all too familiar to the weathered brute. But though the flash was similar, though he recognized something in the way the old man's eyes burned, it was different. Because where Maul's own eye, his one remaining eye, the one eye he held on to throughout his time in the roiling underneath, where it burned with a hungry, cathartic flame, burned with an insatiable lust for destruction, in Ho's eyes, he saw something else, something different. He saw a flash of green. The vermin prince stooped awkwardly, retrieving a musty cloak, one stained and ruined long before it became drenched in the blood of his followers. Him? He's a part of my past. Regrettable. But necessary. Maul screwed up his face, and he scowled at Ho, and softened instantaneously, and spoke. Untie him. He eats with us. The feast, if not particularly savory, was abundant. The busted old table, the largest, most prominent piece of furniture in the vermin prince's royal dining room, was piled high with food, heaped with sustenance, bits of abandoned meals, half-eaten fruits and vegetables, scraps that if not rescued by the vermin prince's followers would have found a home in the bellies of mongrels and scavengers. As the food the feast, the banquet. It was like everything else in those yellow-lit halls. It had been discarded by the city above. But Maul, he didn't seem to notice. Though the food placed before him had been picked over and gnawed upon, Though much of it bore visible bite marks, the brute, the savage, the monster, the destroyer, did not mind. As he, Maul, the one true king of men, though he knew himself deserving of a much finer banquet hall, of a finer grade of food, of a finer grade of company, he also knew something else, and it was far, far more pressing. He was starving. And though the food placed before him was almost universally spoiled, largely rotten, and worthy of the place in the gutters where the vermin prince's followers had retrieved it, it was still far, far better than what had sated his hunger previously. It was far, far better than that horrible sustenance, the one he shuddered to think of, the one that threatened to turn his stomach upside down even now, even freed from that roiling underneath. He clenched his eyes shut and he forced the memory down as he let a slice of overripe fruit slide down his gullet. And as he ate, as he gorged himself, as he shoveled handful after handful into his mouth, he had no use for the chipped wooden utensils offered to him. The prince and his captive, the student and his teacher, the vermin prince and master Ho, they watched in equal parts amazement and disgust. They had never seen someone eat like he did. But of course, 
They had never had the misfortune of laying their eyes upon a destroyer, upon a man burnt, broken, and reconstituted, a man who had nothing but desired everything, a man eternally aggrieved and filled with a hate massed in righteousness. So they watched, merely nibbling themselves, as Maul set upon the feast the same way he attacked all of his conquests, with an undeniable, self-destructive, single-mindedness. Eventually, though he still ate, though he still shoved food into his face at what, for a normal person, would be considered a prodigious pace, eventually, he slowed. His speed tapered off enough that he could bark out speech, could give rise to phrases that, though positioned as questions, were very clearly meant as commands. Where is it? He spoke through mouthfuls, bits of food tumbling out of his steadily moving jaws. The spear. O sat silently, overwhelmed, frightened, confused, watching as the vermin prince attempted to navigate the destroyer's mercurial temperament, as he attempted to answer the brute's question, to obey the king's command without arising his considerable ire. It is in her quarters. The witch's quarters in the tower that she rules from. Maul didn't bother to look up. He simply continued to eat. Guarded. The vermin prince relaxed, easing into the notion that his destroyer, while dangerous, he still remained. On his side. Yes, very much so. The proctors. Maul laughed, spitting half-chewed food out onto the platters before him. Proctors! <laughs> he brushed the spittle away and continued to gorge himself. They are nothing. Nothing but insects. They cannot stand against me. The vermin prince continued. No. No, of course not. But it's not just the proctors. The witch herself. Her magics are fearsome. Frightful. Maul scowled. Do you not have magics of your own? What use are you to me otherwise? The vermin prince struggled to explain himself. No, I, I mean, yes, of course I have magics. Powerful magics. But still, the witch. He allowed his speech to trail off, unwilling to admit the truth. I see. Maul laughed again. If your magics were truly powerful, you wouldn't need me. If your magics were truly powerful, you wouldn't have found yourself with my hands around your throat. The vermin prince swallowed hard, finding himself once again in difficult terrain. I... Yes... That's true. But my magics, they are the ones that can send you on your way. The ones that will send you on your way, that will send you home. He allowed a cautious smile to take hold upon his face. Your magics can send me home. Once I get you your spear, after I beat 
that witch into the dust. Is that right? Maul, his hunger abating, allowed his gluttonous pace to slow. Yes, that's correct. Piranha, she... She taught me things that were beyond my ability, beyond human abilities. She taught me to reach out across the worlds, to reach down to where I found you, down to the... He hesitated to say the words. Down to the roiling underneath. And with that knowledge... With her guidance, with the spear, I can pierce the veil separating us from your home, separating us from the realm of men. Maul picked through the much diminished mound of food before him. Who is Harana? The vermin prince smiled, unaware of the danger that awaited him just ahead. She is a powerful, powerful mage. It was only because of her that I was able to find and rescue you. She was an emissary, a gesture of goodwill sent to... Maul, tearing a crust of bread with his two white teeth, interrupted the vermin prince. An emissary? From who? The vermin prince smiled, proud of the royal connections he'd already made, of the alliance he had forged even before taking his rightful place as the ruler of Ravenna. You, my destroyer, you are not my only ally in this war. I have also made common cause with the ruler of the elf realm, the hereditary queen of the elves. Endless. Maul stood with such speed, with such force, that his simple wooden chair flew back, falling to the floor with the crash that silenced the room. He stood, his burnt face gone pale, his blood gone cold, as the memory came flooding back, as his shattered mind, soothed by time out of the underneath, calmed by nourishment and sustenance, as it recalled what Maul had seen upon first returning to that border realm. The emissary. The elf. The vermin prince forced himself to his feet. Balancing upon his one good leg. Yes. Yes, of course. Hirana was there to supervise your... Maul roared. He howled. He let out a scream of unhinged rage and bloodlust as he flipped the worn, rickety table, sending scraps of food flying around the room. He lashed out, a tantrum of impotent hate and rage. Then he stooped low. He picked up the grisly cudgel that he had allowed to rest at his feet. He clutched it with both hands, clenching his white knuckles around that blackened branch, and with flames burning in his one good eye, He growled. Where is she? Where is the elf? I hope you're digging Scald. It's a lot of work to keep this thing coming out consistently. Keeping the quality as consistent as it is. But it's worth it. I love doing it. The trouble is, as a very niche product, as a very specific thing, it can be difficult getting the word out about it. That's why I am always asking you to leave the show a review on iTunes. The trouble is, a lot of you, most of you even, haven't. And as a result, I've run out of reviews to even read on the show. It costs you nothing, and it only takes a few minutes. Plus, leaving reviews on iTunes and Stitcher is the best way to help spread the word about the only story 
that matters. You know about Patreon, right? I mean, you know that Scald has a Patreon. But do you know what Patreon is? What it really is? I'll tell you. It's a game changer. Before Patreon, there would have been absolutely no way for me to monetize something as weird and awesome as Scald. People wouldn't pay for ads, and if I put it behind a paywall, no one would ever find out about it. Fortunately, Patreon makes all of that unnecessary. Patreon allows Scald fans to do what probably comes pretty natural to them, what should come naturally to them at least. It allows them to kick money toward this show, this thing that you enjoy and listen to every week, without any of that money going to line the pockets of middlemen and advertisers. If you're enjoying Scald, do the right thing and contribute a few bucks a month at patreon.com slash scald. Signing up is fast, simple, and secure. Please talk about Scald on social media. I'm Aubrey Sitterson on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Snapchat. Or you can hit up AubreySitterson.com for links to everything, including Scald, my wrestling talk show Straight Shoot, my comics work like the upcoming G.I. Joe ongoing series, and more. Finally, my weekly recommendation. Have I mentioned Alabama Thunder Pussy on here before? Honestly, I can't remember. I've done 83 of these things now. But even if I have, even if I've talked about it in the past, they absolutely deserve another mention. They sadly aren't a band anymore, but their brand of sludgy, southern fried stoner metal still absolutely rips. I heard their cover of Aerosmith's Sweet Emotion on the radio the other day, and it made me fall in love with them all over again. My favorite album is River City Revival, because that was the first one that I had. But Open Fire and Staring at the Divine are also amazing. Thanks for listening. I'll talk at you next week.